Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this uh, this webinar. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Mark Zeidman, who's going to be uh, <clears throat> giving us a presentation today. Uh, Mark is an assistant professor in the, um, in the Department of Pathology and Immunology at Washington University School of Medicine um, in the section of Pathology and Informatics in the Division of Laboratory and Genomic Medicine. Um, he describes himself as a clinical pathologist data scientist and informatician with a life goal of making the practice of lab medicine less art, more science. He's working to execute this vision through a diverse portfolio of contributions spanning clinical service, research, teaching, and mentorship and service engagement. His research program focuses on developing novel data analytics applications to improve the quality and efficiency of clinical laboratory services by identifying and preventing errors throughout the total laboratory testing cycle from test ordering to result interpretation. Mark, thanks a lot for, uh, agreeing to give this uh, presentation today, and I'll uh, turn it over to you. Thank you again. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, thank you to the Cycle Committee, and thanks to everyone for joining today. Uh, I'm really excited for this presentation. Uh, this is a topic I really enjoy, I find very complex and intriguing, and I hope that through our discussion, I'm going to learn a lot of new uh, tips and tricks for how to give better scientific presentations. So my talk today is give a compelling research presentation using storytelling and data visualization. Giving a scientific presentation is an awesome opportunity. You can establish yourself as an expert. A great presentation will engage your audience, is going to generate interest in you and in your research, and is going to leave a lasting impression. We might not all feel like experts at giving talks, but we are all experts at attending talks. And we've all been to and experienced a good talk, and we've certainly all experienced bad talks as well. So in the good talk, if we all think back, you might remember a feeling of excitement, interest, engagement, like you connected with the speaker and learned something new and grew along with them. On the other hand, in that bad talk, you might have been bored, you might have felt like you were disengaged from that speaker, and that you had trouble following along, and perhaps you felt like a bit of a prisoner in that room, um, unable to leave. And so really what this talk is about is how do we achieve that good talk status? And we're going to uh, go over what I think are really essential tools for how to give a great presentation. Now, I'm going to, of course, caveat that there are many ways to give a great presentation. And um, my presentations are not perfect. I continue to improve them and work on my presentation style. But I think these are practical tools uh, that we can all use to help improve our presenting styles. So step number one. A great presentation will consider the audience. What is the background and expertise of your audience? What are they interested in? What is their attention span, right? So when attending, the good news is that nobody is forced to attend your talk. But your talk might be one of 30 they attend that day. So you really have to recognize that they only have so much attention that they can gift to you. So I cannot emphasize enough, do not show off. The purpose of your talk is not to exhibit how much jargon you know, or how much you worked, or how productive you were. It's about the audience. It's how you can connect with them and how you can share with them your enthusiasm and your key findings and help them feel like they're the smart ones, not that you are smart or impressive. Step number two, a good talk will tell a story. When I say tell a story, I do not mean make up your results or make up your data. Tell a story doesn't mean to lie. Tell a story means to present your study using a narrative, okay? And there's an excellent book uh, by Dr. Randy Olson called Houston, We Have a Narrative, and I highly recommend it. And in this book, he describes a story as a sequence of events that happen en route to solving a problem, 
exactly what we're doing when we're talking about our science. We've identified a critical problem and our research study, our methods, our results, our conclusion, those are the sequence of events that occur as we're trying to solve that important problem. And so a story should have three elements. It should have context, it should have conflict, and then it should have resolution of that conflict. And if we can achieve those three elements within our presentation, then we will better engage our audiences because humans are deeply engaged with stories. So that might seem very abstract. And uh, Dr. Olson provides a template to help you take this idea of giving your presentation a narrative structure and make it very concrete. And so the template here is called and, but, therefore. And so you do the fill in the blanks here. Blank and blank, but blank, therefore blank. So the and statements are the context. And that's where you're setting the scene, giving that uh, audience member kind of the minimum background they need to know. And very quickly, you wanna get to that but statement. And the but statement is the conflict. Here's the problem that arises that needs to be overcome. And it should lead very logically and obviously to the therefore, which is what you did, your study, that helped to resolve that problem. So for example, for a lab medicine talk, an and but therefore statement might read something like, Disease X is common and causes significant morbidity and mortality. And new therapies can help if disease X is diagnosed at an early stage. That's our context. But current diagnostic tests are not sensitive to early disease. That's our problem statement. Therefore, we developed and validated a novel, more sensitive diagnostic test, dot, dot, dot. So here you can see how we can take our study and put it into this and, but, therefore template in order to achieve those three elements of a story, context, conflict, and resolution. Now be careful because you want to not just tell a story, but you want to tell one very clear and simple story. And so Dr. Olson describes the narrative spectrum, which goes from under narrative to little narrative to overly narrative, too much narrative. So too little narrative is when we're failing to tell any narrative story. And you'll know that's true because you'll be sitting in that talk and you'll be getting and, 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 and. Here's a graph and here's a figure and here's a metric, and here's another graph, and you can't piece it together in your head. You don't understand why is this person telling me all of this information? That's the hallmark of too little narrative. Now, the sweet spot is you use that and, but, therefore to make yourself commit to one narrative arc, one problem and resolution statement. Now, on the other hand, too much narrative is when you have too many problems and twists and turns to your story. And that's gonna sound like blank and blank, but blank, therefore blank. Yet, therefore, however, therefore, on the other hand, and as you can see, the logical thread becomes very complex and twisted and hard to follow. And so uh, you can lose your audience by having too little narrative, but you can also lose your audience by having too much narrative. And often when we get into the too much narrative is when we're so excited about all our work that we want to share it all. I want to tell you about everything and every challenge we had and every twist and turn. But you got to remember, this is the first time the audience is thinking about your project. And so you need to make it simple so that they actually have an opportunity to understand and appreciate uh, one story um, since they won't be able to consume many. Which brings us to the next point. Focus your talk, okay? Focusing 
here involves choosing one story to tell. Focusing your talk also means removing any unnecessary information. I think a really good exercise is to ask yourself, if I remove this graph, if I remove this slide, will the audience still understand my story? If the answer is yes, then probably the right answer is to remove it. This can be very hard to do because we're so emotionally invested in our work. We're so attached to that figure that we worked so hard to produce. And that's where getting feedback from colleagues, from friends, uh, from folks who are not so emotionally attached to the work can be very helpful as they'll guide you on what parts are dispensable and what parts are indispensable. Okay. The next tip is to use a very clear structure to help the audience follow your talk. You might have heard of the concept of an hourglass structure, which is suggesting that you should start very broad with you know, a problem that affects a large swath of society. And then you're going to narrow down to a very specific problem that you're going to try to address in your research study. And then at the end, you wanna broaden back out to relate back to the general problem issue uh, that you started with. I would suggest to use an extreme hourglass structure, meaning take that hourglass and stretch it out really long. And what that's telling you is start general, but very quickly narrow to your specific background and specific problem statement. Then you're gonna proceed in a very linear way and logical way through your methods, your results, your conclusion, all within that narrow context. And only at the end will you briefly zoom back out to relate back to the general relevance of your work. We can talk for a long, long time about slide design. I think there are folks who dedicate their entire career to how to generate compelling slides. So I'm just going to speak in general principles. And I will suggest that the most important thing is that your slides are there to support you and to help the audience pay attention to you and what you're saying. And so don't let them distract from you. So here's an example where I have a very, very complex display element on the left and a wall of text on the right. If your slide looks like this, then your audience has to make a choice. Are they going to look at your figure, your complex figure, and try to understand it? Are they going to read all these words? Or are they going to continue to pay attention and listen to you? And we've all been there, one lapse of attention, and it's hard to rejoin the speaker. And so you really don't want to lose your audience. So keep your slides simple so that they support you and do not distract from you. You can use a visual hierarchy in order to guide your audience in how you want them to proceed through reading your slide. I love this slide that I borrowed from Dr. Nick Spees, one of my colleagues. And what's illustrating is that um, you can direct the audience's attention sequentially by using a visual hierarchy where the largest fonts and objects are going to direct the immediate attention of the audience, followed by the uh, lower elements of your visual hierarchy. Okay, so we're not going to get to spend enough time on data, data analytics, and data visualization. But here is, I think, the most important thing you should think about. When you're thinking about data visualization, imagine you're cooking dinner for a very picky five-year-old, okay? And so you're trying to figure out a very complex problem, which is how do I make something that is appealing to this picky five-year-old that is nutritious and going to uh, help them be healthy and that they're actually going to eat, okay? So if we conceptualize it that way, then the data is the raw ingredients that we're using. The data analytics are all of the 
kitchen instruments that we use to process the data. Um, and then the data visualization is how we construct that final plate and how we provide you know, tools for the end user to consume the information we're trying to communicate to them. What's illustrated here is that the most important thing is that you match your data, your data analytics, and your visualization with the preferences, appetites, and needs of the end user, right? Think about it. Even if pizza with pepperoni is your five-year-old's favorite food, by the fifth slice, they're not going to be interested, right? So you got to make sure that you're constructing uh, display elements and visualizations that the end user is going to want to consume. For more on the science of data visualization, which there truly is a science, I recommend that everyone check out this upcoming ADLM University course by Dr. Nick Spees, Dr. Vicky Dazimi, and Dr. Dustin Bunch on visualizing laboratory data, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, this session is going to give you, you know, really digging into the depths of how you use color theory and uh, visual cues to make your visualizations more effective. All right, so when you're presenting, you need to be energetic and enthusiastic. Okay, if you don't have enthusiasm for what you're talking about, surely your audience will not. This can often be hard because um, it can be stressful to speak in public and we all feel nervous. And the great thing is that it's a-okay to be nervous. As long as you take that nervous energy and reframe it. I am nervous because I am excited about my presentation. What you have to watch out for is that nerves don't manifest in uh, ways that are portraying either being closed off or pulling away from the audience, uh, which gives you the sense that you're not interested in, present in, in presenting your work, right? So channel that nervous energy as excitement and you will draw the audience in to your presentation. And, and this is something we all struggle with because we're all busy and we run out of time, but practice your talk and get feedback. Get feedback from colleagues you trust, from friends uh, who are going to give you honest feedback and help you refine your talk. And so um, what we're going to do today is now that we've gone through uh, what I think are kind of key important principles for giving a good talk is that we're going to shift gears. I'm going to present for you a talk that I'm developing. This is draft number two of my talk. And what I want you to do is listen to my scientific research talk, and then we're going to regroup after and have a discussion. And I wanna hear from you, how can I improve this talk? What worked, what didn't work? What are your tips for giving a great scientific presentation, okay? So my motivation is a couple. One is that I think that it would be very interesting to learn from this audience how they give scientific presentations. And then two is that I really wanna normalize getting feedback. If I can be on this webinar and present a talk that's not a perfect talk and survive getting feedback, then surely, everyone here can uh, survive getting friendly feedback from you know, a trusted colleague or friend. So before we do that, I'll just recap. Here were my practical tips to improve your presentations. First is you have to consider your audience and make a presentation that will be interesting to your audience. You need to tell a single, simple, and clear story you have to focus, focus, focus. Give your talk structure. Make sure your slides don't distract from you. And similarly, use your data and data visualization both sparingly and effectively to provide something that your audience wants, wants to and is capable of consuming. And then finally, 
practice feedback. So before we switch gears, I just want to acknowledge my colleagues in the Division of Laboratory and Genomic Medicine uh, who have contributed to developing the concepts of this talk. And then also, you may have noticed I used a bunch of images that were auto-generated by uh, DALL-E, an AI tool. So let me uh, switch over my slide decks here. Is everyone able to see my slides? Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. All right, so um, I'm going to present a research project uh, that we've been working on. And uh, the title of my presentation is Utility of a Single Step Reflex uh, Urinalysis Reflex Algorithm for Detecting Uropathies in Neutropenic Patients. Urinary tract infection detection is challenging in neutropenic patients. Uh, neutropenia is a condition characterized by a decreased absolute neutrophil count, and it's very common in cancer patients. The challenges are that these patients are at a very high risk of complications of urinary tract infections, including pyelonephritis and urosepsis. The other challenge is that our conventional testing strategies may not work very well for this population. And that's what I'll tell you about. So one of those strategies is reflexive urine testing. Um, this testing algorithm aims to balance diagnostic sensitivity for urinary tract infections with culture stewardship because overutilization of cultures leads to unnecessary antibiotics and wasted resources. On this slide, I'm showing a typical double step reflex where uh, only specimen that are positive by chemical urinalysis proceed on to microscopic urinalysis, and then only those that are positive in microscopic urinalysis are subjected to urine culture. Now the problem arises that urine microscopy may lack sensitivity in neutropenic patients. Uh, this is a figure I adopted from a publication from Claussen and colleagues. And what is plotted on the y-axis is the number of culture positive patients uh, in their study broken out on the x-axis by neutropenic patients versus controls. And what is additionally one of 23 patients uh, with neutropenia were positive in urine microscopy versus 21 of 31 in the control group. So there was a significantly lower rate of microscopic urinalysis positivity among neutropenic patients. And what that means is that our conventional double-step reflex that requires microscopy positivity may lack sensitivity in this patient group. So as a result, uh, there's an alternative single-step algorithm that has been proposed and adopted at many institutions, including our own, and that's shown on the right. And here, any sample that is positive by chemical urinalysis proceeds directly to urine culture, plus or minus microscopic urinalysis. And so the difference here is the single-step algorithm does not require a positive microscopic urinalysis before culture. However, uh, there have not been prior publications that have demonstrated the real-world clinical utility of this single-step reflex strategy. How much does it actually improve the detection of uropathogens, and how much does it increase the burden of urine culture? And that is the question that we wanted to answer. And so we performed a single institution retrospective data analysis to tell you about our institution, uh, Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri is a large urban tertiary care center. And our microbiology lab services about six regional hospitals in the area. Uh, we have two orderables available 
a conventional double step reflex. And then a single step reflex we introduced in 2018 that's intended for use in severely neutropenic patients. Uh, at our institution, we define a positive urine culture as greater than 10 to the fourth colony forming units per ml for a straight catheter specimen and 10 to the fifth for other specimen types. So in our study, uh, we defined our cohort as all UA with reflex to culture orders on patients greater than 18 years. These had to be processed at the Barnes Jewish Hospital lab between June 2018 and October 2022, so approximately a four and a half year period. For each order, uh, we categorized that patient as uh, one of different categories of neutropenia based on the most recent absolute neutropenia count within up to seven days. We defined uh, a neutropenia of none as greater than 1,500 neutrophils per cum, mild as 1,000 to 1,500, moderate as 500 to 1,000, and then severely neutropenic as fewer than 500 cells. Unknown neutropenia uh, was for um, samples that did not have an ANC available within seven days of order. On the right, I'm plotting the volumes of UA reflex orders broken out by neutropenia category. And what you can see is that the uh, most common was unknown neutropenia status, about 62% of orders, uh, followed by non-neutropenic or none, and that uh, severely neutropenic patients were about 2% of our cohort. So our first result is that the single step orderable was not being utilized as intended. On the left, I'm showing the relative utilization of the double step and single step reflex for patients of differing degrees of neutropenia. While it is apparent that the utilization of the single step reflex in light gray increases with increasing severity of neutropenia, what we find is that even the most severely neutropenic patients, about 80% of the orders are for the double step and not the single step reflex. We also see evidence of over utilization on the right. Here I'm plotting the number of orders for the single step reflex broken out by neutropenia. And what you can see is that only 28% of the orders for this orderable that's intended only for use in severely neutropenic patients was actually placed on patients with evidence of severe neutropenia. So there's overutilization in non-neutropenic patients. Our next finding is that the chemical reflex rate, which is the first step in both algorithms, did not vary significantly with neutropenia. There was about a 70% reflex rate across all neutropenia bins. On the other hand, the microscopy reflex rates were significantly correlated with neutropenia with a decreasing rate of meeting microscopic reflex criteria, which at our institution is white blood cells greater than 10 per high powered field. And that became less and less as the degree of neutropenia increased. So the rate of this criteria was only about 7% for severely neutropenic patients versus about 27% for non-neutropenic patients. So as a result, the rate of reflexing to culture was dependent on neutropenic status for the patients who received the double step reflex shown in the dark gray bars, but did not significantly vary for those who got the single step. You'll also notice that the culture rates were about 70% for the single step reflex, which was significantly greater than that for the double step across all neutropenia severity bins. Finally, what we found is that the single step reflex has a very high 
cost to benefit ratio. So on the left, we estimated the cost as the number of additional cultures we performed uh, for patients with single step reflex orders that we would not have performed if they had been ordered for the double step reflex. And so uh, over four years, we performed almost 1,700 additional urine cultures. Uh, you can see 585 of those were for patients in the targeted patient population, severely neutropenic. And the remainder were actually mostly for patients who were either not neutropenic or had unknown neutropenia status. Now, with respect to the benefit, uh, we did detect 49 additional uropathogens that we would not have otherwise detected without the use of the single step orderable. Only 12 of those, however, uh, were observed for patients with biochemical evidence of neutropenia. So when we put that all together, what we find is that we have to perform approximately 140 additional urine cultures for each single additional uropathogen we detected in a patient with biochemical evidence of neutropenia. For us, this was an unfavorable cost-to-benefit ratio. We're still working to understand what is driving this unfavorable cost-benefit ratio. And we suspect that the low clinical yield here may be multifactorial. Uh, first, one contributing factor is the misutilization that I described previously, and another may be poor patient selection. So as you can see in this plot, on the y-axis, we have the rate of culture positivity, x-axis neutropenia, and broken out by the different orderables. And the striking trend here is that the culture positivity rate is extremely low for severely neutropenic patients, regardless of the orderable only about 2% versus almost 8 to 9% for non-neutropenic patients. This might reflect poor patient selection, um, overutilization of UTI testing in neutropenic patients. Perhaps doctors are concerned because these patients are at high risk. Alternatively, it may be true that these patients are heavily exposed to antibiotics, either prophylactically, or broad spectrum antibiotics, and that may mitigate the sensitivity of culture. So the outcome of our study was that offering a single step reflex orderable alone has limited clinical utility. We improved the detection of clinically significant uropathogens, about 12 over the course of four and a half years. And at the same time, it significantly increased the culture burden. We had to perform approximately 1,700 additional urine cultures. The significance of these findings is that it highlights that there remains a critical care gap to develop a testing strategy for this patient cohort that balances diagnostic sensitivity with culture stewardship. These studies also inform immediate future directions. So first, we are working to automate the reflex selection in order to improve the utilization patterns. And that's illustrated in this figure. On the top was our established process where the physician had to select the strategy uh, from different orderables available in our computerized physician order entry module. We have now uh, shifted that selection uh, from the physician to the laboratory. So the physician can only select a single UA with reflex culture order. And then the decision of the double step versus single step reflex is made within the laboratory in an automated way by uh, performing a seven day look back. And if the ANC is less than 400, the single step reflex is performed greater than 400, double step. We're also working to improve patient selection by providing provider education on the importance of culture stewardship and by developing new data analytics and machine learning tools to try to identify, based on patient characteristics, 
who should receive the single step reflex. So with that, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators, Dr. Amy Zhao, Melanie Yarbrough, and Ronald Jacobs, and I'd be happy to take any questions. All right, so here's the deal. Let's skip the questions on this specific research study. And instead, I want to hear from you, uh, how can I improve this presentation? Uh, what worked, what didn't work, and I hope we'll have a fruitful conversation. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I just wanted to mention that you can uh, either put notes in the chat um, uh, to give feedback, or um, I think perhaps you can unmute yourself as well for discussion. So I'll go ahead and get started. So first of all, I actually thought it was a very good talk. So this is hard. This is me really nitpicking here. But I would say perhaps maybe on slide eight, if you wouldn't mind going to slide eight, when you were describing the patient cohort, I felt like there was a lot of time spent on that, but maybe not as much was needed. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, I thought that when going through this, it took a long time to get to the problem statement. And uh, so I think those opportunities for where to streamline um, getting to the question and the conflict uh, would be helpful. So I agree. Thank you. Yeah, that's interesting, Jamie, because I, I made a note about this slide because I, I try I spent a lot of time. I, I think I agree it's an excellent talk. I think it breaks down the data really nicely, the categories, uh, like the way you have the graphs presented. It's simple, not too many colors, you know, uh, the slides are not busy. Uh, but this was the one slide that also stood out to me as I I kind of was trying to figure out what's the take home message <laughs> or whether this could be more slide it should be more slides or less information. Um, yeah. Let me ask that. Um, what are your guys's take on the quote unquote obligatory table one cohort uh, characteristics? Do you include it? Do you not include it? Does anybody want to chime in from the audience? <laughs> I'm I'm happy to also provide feedback. I I think it's very important. I think what you mentioned about antibiotic use and that being a kind of founding factor that could have actually maybe in, uh be included up front uh in the characteristics whether they're on antibiotics or not. But maybe that information was not available. Um, I see a comment in the chat here from someone. Um, Gerhardt uh, Gropner is asking, you left out one important consideration, namely that severe neutropenic patients may be susceptible to infections that cannot be cultured easily under standard conditions. Gerhardt, can you expand on that? Gerhardt, if you're speaking, you you might be muted. Perhaps he's typing his response. Um, can we think of this then as uh, being sure to list any possible areas of weakness in your study? Like, should you also address that in your presentation? Like, what the strengths and weaknesses of your experiments? Yeah, agreed. Okay. A limitation section. Mm -hmm. And we have a request to see your title slide again. Yes. I I see another comment. Maybe the comment about the title was, uh, I'm not sure if someone was, Grant McBride is uh, mentioning that. Uh, Perhaps uh, this doesn't mention this two-step algorithm or its existence. I'm not sure if that's what um, they're referring to. Whether the title could be 
reflective of comparing, uh, not comparing the two, but including the different the existence of different algorithms. Yeah, I think the idea of maintaining internal consistency throughout is important and something that comes with uh, iterations of editing and refinement. Um, Darcy, you popped on. Did you have a comment? I was, maybe I missed this, honestly, um, but uh, I was wondering about, because I think this is a really contentious topic, <laughs> and um, what guidelines are out there? You know, maybe you said this, um, and I missed it, but, you know, kind of, what is that background? You know, who weighs in on this? Um, who are those experts? What did they say? Um, you probably alluded to it some because you, you know, you, you set up really nicely the impetus for the study, but, you know, at the end you were like, Hey, this is rotten. So we need to do something different. Um, so like, where, where did that land and, you know, how does that fit in the greater scheme? Should we adopt that or, you know? Yeah. You're right. UTI testing is is a very controversial. Uh, urinary tract infection testing is a very controversial topic. Uh, e even whether or not to implement a reflex algorithm, uh, what are the reflex criteria? These are areas of great practice variation. Also, caveat that I am not a microbiologist. I am an informatician and data scientist. Um, so yes, I, I think those are are valid questions. Um, I think though the data support that uh, we didn't solve this problem by simply providing an orderable with the option of a single step reflex. Yeah. Um, let's let's pivot back to the um, the presentation kind of formulation. So um, let me pose the question, was the narrative clear? Was there a clear context? conflict resolution uh, form to it? And if not, what can we do to improve it? I am not a microbiologist either. And so I did think that the presentation was very clear for me. I felt like it was enjoyable because I could follow along because of the additional uh, like ad libs that you would give here and there uh, for to you know directed towards people who maybe this isn't their specialty. How did we feel about the level of jargon? Uh, too much, too little, were terms defined and minimized? There was there was some jargon like A and C. I forgot at some point what A and C means, but then I remembered it. So I did have to spend a bit of time recalling things. Uh, I don't know about others, but I think it will depend on the level of the expertise in this area for the audience and how much they encounter your analysis, possibly. And uh, I just wanted to mention, we do have a couple other comments, but uh, we can continue along this discussion line and we can mention those also later. What are the other comments? Oh, yes, okay. So we had um, a comment from Anil Chokala, uh, and that's just a second, let me. Um, he, he did mention something, I think in, an interesting point that there is large bars showing none and unknown, which are kind of poorly characterized or less characterized data sets or groups. Um, and uh, he mentioned that it's hard to focus on the mild, moderate and severe groups. Um, so that might be distracting, uh, potentially. Yeah. So the first time I presented this was for my residents. And I initially had everything broken out by orderable and neutropenia status. And so this was actually already a one round of simplification of the visualizations. And I think Anil is pointing out that even further simplification might be of benefit to really just hyper-focus on what are the key findings? Uh, thank you for that for that comment. Thank you. Yes. So the other uh, we had um, oh F from Grant McBride. I think we covered this topic as well. Just to mention it again, it was about using single step urinalysis. The title doesn't mention the two step. 
Um, Melissa Bennett um, responded, for me, the story was well laid out. This is not my area of expertise, but I was able to follow along. The only part that lost me was the very end when you mentioned the lab values that are used to determine a two-step versus single step. How were those values determined? Is your plan to continue monitoring the data? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I didn't describe that part. So we're talking about here. That, yes, that slide. So that decision for greater than 400, less than 400 is actually driven by our data. Uh, we found something kind of surprising, which is that um, while it is true that we see similar results as Klassen and colleagues that neutropenic patients with are, are less likely to meet the microscopic reflex criteria, if you break it out into neutropenic patients with a negative urine culture versus positive, we find that those with a positive urine culture, the majority of them actually meet the microscopic criteria. Okay. And so it may be just that the pretest probability is lower in those patients explaining why they're not meeting white blood cell criteria because they don't have a UT. Okay. And it's only when you get below 400 that that impact of not having enough neutrophils to meet the criteria becomes significant. So it seems like that concern of the limited sensitivity of the microscopic reflex is becomes critical below 400. And that's where we set that up. Uh, it was in the first version of the talk and then um, I was trying to shorten it. And so I removed it down. So Mark, while you're on this slide, I this was the only other comment that I had about the talk was that although this is not a very busy image on the right, it didn't correspond to what you were talking about at the beginning of the slide. And I could not help myself but looking at the images. And then I was like, wait, he's not talking about this right now. Yes. Um, and, and you don't start until kind of the future direction section. So my recommendation would be maybe to like include a white box to cover it until you're ready to talk about it and then unveil it if you want the audience to focus on what you're saying in the beginning of the slide. Yes, yes, great call out. So that's an example of a complex figure uh, causing the audience to have to choose between listening to what I'm saying or looking at the figure. And so, yeah, ways to deal with that. One would be a click through slide uh, where you hide that image until you're ready to talk about it. Uh, another would be just to break it into two slides. So there'd be a significant slide and then a future direction slide following. Mm -hmm. So we have one more comment. Uh, I um, for Melissa Bennett, I, they think they're, you're a wonderful speaker. The pace was excellent and made things easier to follow. So a lot of po positive feedback, but thank you for giving us the chance to pick apart your presentation. <laughs> this is not something that most people may, would be comfortable with, maybe. So this is an interesting, a very interesting discussion, but definitely helps, I think, improve um, further improve. So it's 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 a great um suggestion also to um, get feedback from your colleagues. Any other feedback that um, people I have? Think this is, I think this is something we can all do for our trainees, which is our trainees always see us give our, you know, we're, as we get advanced and comfortable into our roles and positions, uh, we often end up with the talk that we've given a million times. And that's what the trainees give us, see us talk. And then the trainees are in this very uncomfortable position in which is they have to talk about things they just learned about. And so I think if we can normalize that making a talk is a journey, is a process, and that, you know, you're not going to be driven out of town if your talk, if your practice talk is not perfect, I think that could be very useful. I think for me, it's just the honest truth is that um, my talks, I get my talk to where I want it to be by getting feedback and making it better and better. Um, I'm not a person who can just, you know, put a first draft together that's ready to go. Yeah, I think it's something maybe we lose over time as trainees. Uh, we get a lot of that practice and a lot of that feedback. And then once you are practicing, you, you kind of on your on your own. And then maybe it's a lot, a lot of us at least for me, I kind of stopped getting that feedback. And then once you present that, that's when you realize, oh, I could have done this and that better. But this is a great uh, suggestion, not just for trainees, but also 
for those who are already practicing uh, to get feedback from our colleagues uh, um, if they have a chance. We have one more comment from Grant McBride. I was surprised at CPOE that physicians could choose single or double step UA. How was that surprising, Grant? And feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to. Mark, this is Grant McBride from Australia, actually. Um, look, I, I was a bit surprised that the physicians would have the skill set to know the difference between a single and double step UA. I, I mean, I'm just actually surprised by that. I wouldn't have even given them the uh, um, that ability to do that. I, I thought that's a lab, uh, lab consideration, not a clinician consideration. I think our data suggests that you're correct, right? We saw that most of the orders for that single step reflex were inappropriately placed on non-neutropenic patients. And then uh, most of our neutropenic patients were not getting the intended single step reflex. So I think what we learned was that, you know, uh, putting it on the physician just added to the complexity of their order menu and uh, was not, you know, a robust way to adjudicate between which was the most appropriate reflex. So thank you for your comment. That's well taken. Is it possible that during order entry, the one that they're choosing, you know, most commonly is just the first one that's listed and they kind of just choose that more commonly. Most people maybe just want to go proceed with the order and uh, will not look at the options. There's certainly data that, yeah, there are different biases in terms of display orders that can uh, lead to misutilization patterns. Yeah. Um, so when I'm for this talk, um, you know, if we go back to the first presentation, um, so I tried to think that I'm going to present to a lab medicine audience. Granted, not all microbiologists. So that was kind of how I was thinking through the audience. Uh, for my and but therefore template, you know, you can kind of imagine the and st statements were going to be, you know, neutropenic patients are at high risk of complication and they might not be able to meet white blood cell criteria. And uh, there's special testing algorithms that are intended to. Uh, improve sensitivity while maintaining culture sensitivity, uh, culture stewardship, excuse me. The but statement was that the gap that I identified was that we don't know how they actually work in practice. What is the value provided? What are the costs accrued? And so the therefore was then, therefore we did a retrospective look back at the period since we have uh, provided this as an option within our orderable system. So that's how I thought through, you know, what was the story of this talk? Okay. Um, and then in terms of that narrative structure actually fits very well with what we're all very familiar with, which is the structure of a talk, the structure of the paper, right? Which is introduction, methods, results, conclusion. So the introduction is where you give the context and state the problem, right? What is the gap you're going to address? And then the methods results conclusion are the therefore. So these are the steps we took on a journey and route to trying to resolve that conflict or problem. So that's kind of the story framework. And then once, once I have the story framework, now is what we're going through, you know, which is actually the really hard bit, I think, which is kind of editing it down to like, you know, um, I'll tell you now the first version of this was maybe twice as long in terms of data slides, right? It was way, way too much. This may still be too much. I'd be interested to see how it was for this audience. Um, but then it seems like also in that process of contracting, I've also lost a couple of details for some of the folks on this call, right? So that focusing, that distillation of the key results and findings are really important. But what I would point out is that giving it a story 
did not mean, of course, you know, telling a story in terms of a confabulation. It's still, we're still trying to be empiric and rigorous and academic and that we're going to present from the data and trying to support the conclusion that we'll draw at the end. Any comments on, so we had some discussion of data visualization. Um, I really encourage everyone to go attend that university course. You'll learn about why bar graphs are better ways than, for example, pie graphs for uh, presenting relative rates. Um, and I tried to stick to a few of those different principles here. Any final comments? Oh, there's one message uh, from Gerhardt. There is growing evidence by experimental, not diagnostic, NGS sequencing of culture negative urines. The bacteria detected are not the species that are detectable under routine five day culture procedures. Oh, okay, so that's a referring to the previous comment about um, um, the inability to detect um, the uh, a, or the uh, positive urine cultures um, not being predictive, I guess, using standard culture methodologies. Gerhard, it seems like you have a lot of really interesting insights into these data. Maybe you and I could have an offline conversation. I'd love to get more of your more of your input on this study. Definitely a room for collaboration, I guess, always. Um, so now we're at two minutes to five, so I think perhaps we'll conclude here unless there's any final comments. I just wanted to thank uh, Mark again uh, on behalf of the ADLM uh, cycle subcommittee for giving this presentation. Um, and the ADLM staff for helping organize this and the subcommittee members for assisting with uh, and supporting the organization of uh, Mark's presentation. Um, and uh, thank you very much.